This is the In Focus podcast from the Hindu. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Hindu's In Focus podcast. I'm Zubeda Hamid, your host for today. This March was the hottest on record globally, the 10th month in a row to hit this peak. This has led to a 1.58 degree Celsius spike in the global average temperature compared to pre-industrial levels. Does this feel surprising? No. Most parts of India have been sweltering since last month. The IMD had forecast heat wave conditions in parts of at least 10 states last week, and it's only going to get worse in May. This year, the heat is even believed to have impacted voting in our crucial general elections and the election commission has now set up a task force to oversee heat wave conditions. We are used to scorching summers in India, but experts say that heat waves are now arriving earlier in the year, are more frequent and are also lasting longer, which means they have a huge impact on the health of humans, animals, on our agriculture, our food, our cities, our water resources and our energy supplies. How does the unrelenting heat affect our bodies and our long-term health into the future? Do our food crops become less nutritious as temperatures rise? Do India's standards for heat waves need updating? Where is our country placed globally when it comes to extreme climate events and can we expect more of these in the near future? We explore these questions and more with Purnima Prabhakaran, Director, Center for Health Analytics Research and Trends, Trivedi School of Biosciences at Ashoka University. Good morning and welcome to the Hindus in Focus podcast Dr. Purnima Prabhakaran. Hi, good morning. Ma'am, a severe heat wave is now underway in many parts of our country this week as per the IMD's predictions even as we are going for the second phase of polling in the Lok Sabha elections. could you explain to us why this is happening yes i think overall the changing climatic conditions can be uh, attributed as a root cause of what's happening in india as well we can say that the uh, in india what we're seeing is increasing number of heat waves not just in terms of numbers but also in terms of the frequency the intensity as well as the duration of the heat waves that we are seeing earlier the heat waves used to be in only certain geographies but now it's not just in the north and uh, central or the west western parts of india but also southern and peninsular india are increasingly being exposed to extreme heat um we could attribute this to an el nino phenomenon you know where there is a um, uh, surface phenomena which prevents cloud formation and therefore drier conditions are are seen across uh, the country You said that we have seen an increase in the frequency and the duration of the heat waves and it is affecting geographies that all, that used to not be affected earlier ma'am. So what parts of India are now prone to heat waves or is the entire country now vulnerable? I think overall the mean annual temperature has been increasing across the country. If you come down to a granular level it used to be the northern and the west western parts of India which were definitely uh, prone earlier to heat waves. but now we are also seeing this in uh, you know the eastern and southern peninsula i think it's a combination of the climatic uh, changing climatic conditions but also anthropogenic causes i think we are seeing growth at at a unwarranted pace across the country and changing built environments and you know what we call the urban heat islands i think a combination of factors um, is causing the trapping of heat and i uh, we could attributed to a mixture of uh, these events so talk to us a little bit are the heat waves starting earlier now do you think maybe it was earlier in may and june but now it's starting say even by march because at least from what we are feeling the heat seems to be beginning earlier and earlier every year definitely i think this kind of what we attribute to was you know freaky weather you know we never saw these kind of rising temperatures you know as early as march there are some parts of the country that are seeing unusually hot days very early in the year it's 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 not just may and june but even as early as march um and it's not just the i think the day temperatures we're also seeing uh night temperatures which are increasing and this can be uh, you know increasingly uncomfortable because even the nights are, are you know not not uh, there's not enough cooling that's happening in the nights as well talk to us a little bit about what you said the urban heat island phenomenon 
So urban heat islands, uh, you know, are a phenomenon that's being uh, increasingly observed in countries like ours, where there's uh, unhampered growth that goes on and uh, cities are just become dense island, islands of buildings where there is less and less of green spaces and water bodies. And the trapping of heat between these uh, environments uh, causes localized uh, increase in temperature. And these urban heat islands, I mean, can be responsible for anywhere from two to four degrees Celsius increase within uh, city environments, for example. And uh, this can have harmful impacts on the health of populations in these environments. Let's get into that a little bit, Doctor. So uh, what? how is this year-on-year increased temperature, the longer duration of the heat waves and the earlier setting in of the heat waves affecting our long-term health? Heat-related illness, uh, we can look at it from two lenses. One that's, you know, as a result of acute um, exposure to high temperatures. So it can be as, uh, you know, uh, wide as just simple exhaustion, you know, you are Continuous exposure to high temperatures can result in a feeling of generalized tiredness. So heat exhaustion at an extreme end, it can lead to fainting. So what we call as heat syncope. But at the other end, it can also exacerbate illnesses in people who are already ill. So chronic morbidities are a common scene now with many adults, for example. So, you know, diabetes, hypertension. People with these kind of chronic illnesses are more vulnerable. So exposure to extreme heat can exacerbate these conditions. Elderly and other extremes of age, like young children, the elderly, are also particularly vulnerable to these uh, exposures to higher temperatures. Um, There's a condition called heat stroke, which can occur when the core body temperature increases to a, to an extent where it can cause uh, you know uh, uh, impacts on on the uh, brain health so this wide range of impacts on human health um, really needs our urgent attention because the increase in heat waves is not just uh, you know in certain pockets i think it's it's across the board so it's high time that we pay attention to you know uh, protecting human health, more from a preventive aspect. It's, it's possible now to forecast these heat waves. So I think prevention is is uh, key. And um, I, I think there's a lot to be done and can be done uh, to protect human health. Let's talk a little bit. Let's come back to the health question again, ma'am. But let's talk a little bit about what is the current threshold used to define a heat wave. And some experts have said that this is an old threshold and maybe it needs modification. Yeah, I think when the temperatures go beyond 40 degrees um, in the plains, when we're talking about, you know, uh, flat areas, and and it remains at that for two days consecutively, uh, the heat wave is declared. The threshold is slightly different when we take coastal areas or, you know, mountainous hilly regions. Uh, But uh, another way to look at it is if the departure from uh, temperatures beyond 4.5 degrees from the from the annual, um, you know, the regular annual temperature, the mean temperature that we have seen in the past. So these thresholds have, yes, been developed um, a while ago. And I think looking at the way the, uh, you know, the, the discomfort levels are also increasing at lower temperatures, it possibly is a red alert for us as well to probably look at, you know, revisiting these thresholds, taking into account uh, the impact on human health. Because it's not just at 40 degrees that you begin to feel uncomfortable, right? You feel uncomfortable way before you hit that mark. Yes, I think it's a combination of things, right? I mean, it's not just a temperature. The humidity levels also play a role. So if the relative humidity is high, one cannot sweat and the discomfort is felt at a greater level. So there is this concept of thermal comfort, so which takes into account not just the ambient temperature, but also the humidity levels. So if, if the humidity is low, you're able to sweat and the heat can be dissipated. But if the humidity is high, you cannot sweat and you feel that much more uncomfortable. So I think this also needs to be taken into account, a combination of um, you know humidity as well, when we're accounting for the discomfort levels that people feel. 
let's get back to the health a little bit ma'am you spoke to us about uh, fainting and you know heat stroke when your uh, core body temperatures uh, becomes really high but year on year what does research tell us year on year is this heat going to have an effect on say children who are growing up now who can who can grow up to have be more vulnerable for instance to health problems let, let me uh, start by saying i think uh, there is some research that has happened especially and i'm talking about research in india so exposure to extreme temperatures definitely um, does not all go well for for the health uh, of children so uh, for example pregnant women exposed to extreme temperatures could have uh, adverse birth consequences and when i say that i mean in terms of birth weight uh, there could be lower birth weight there could be a uh, greater uh, you know chances for miscarriages so starting at that end of the spectrum you know adverse birth consequences uh, for pregnant women think about uh, what happens for, for lactating women for example there could be per- probably consequences i mean there hasn't been much research to document it at least in india but you know breastfeeding patterns could change and that definitely is going to have consequences for the children you know starting from infants uh going uh, across the spectrum to children and adolescents i think exposure to uh, extreme temperatures can have impacts in terms of feeding patterns in terms of physical activity um, and that indirectly can fuel you know well, impacts on on child weight for example if there is going to be extreme temperature and people are children are going to be prevented from playing outdoors they're going to end up sitting indoors probably watching more hours of television or playing you know on their screens and it kind of indirectly is fueling childhood overweight and obesity this has implications in the long term definitely these are you know lifestyle disorders that get fueled very early in life and get perpetuated um, along the life span and definitely sets them up for greater propensity to adult disease lifestyle diseases in particular like diabetes and higher blood pressure taking a broader look at this how does the heat affect our food security in india will it have a long term impact on nutrition for instance yes and i think that's an important area that you pick up now because india i think is largely an agrarian economy we depend so much on our um, agricultural um, kind of uh, you know domain food production has definitely um, taken a hit so extreme temperatures or even just the rising temperatures across the board have impacts on uh, crop production so reduced uh, pr- production of crops on on a on a global basis for example has impacts on food security and for a country like india which is still battling with both extremes you know mal of malnutrition under nutrition as well as over nutrition food insecurity is is an important area an area of concern it's not just the global uh, you know the food production as a whole it's also the maturation patterns of the crops so while there's definitely impact on the global productivity it's also the maturation patterns uh, crops mature faster because of the higher temperatures and that affects the nutrient content so micronutrient levels in the crops are also affected so there's in addition to food insecurity there's also nutrient insecurity and that can definitely have an impact on you know the nutrition health of our people so definitely there is an impact i think on the other side is farming households that are impacted by uh, you know extreme temperatures reduced crop productivity also has impacts on the economy in the farming households it has been um, kind of demonstrated that is has impacts for farmers mental health as well suicide rates have increased so it's there is kind of both direct as well as indirect impacts on farming households so what you mean is that there are cascading consequences to this the rise in temperature leading to yes crops maturing faster nutritional nutritional insufficiency which in turn affects obviously the crop losses affect farmers which affects their mental health etc correct talk to us ma'am a little bit about um the many extremes of 
climate events that we are seeing now we we are seeing everything uh, from from flooding to landslides to hurricanes to cyclones and the prediction is that with the global temperature rising that hurricane or cyclone season can become worse is this something that india needs to be concerned about i think so i mean in terms of i um, mean as in a, as a country i think we are seeing more and more extreme weather events uh, whether that's you know in the form of heat waves or droughts floods I think uh, the numbers are increasing for sure. So whether it's the heat and drought situation or, you know, the hurricanes and cyclones and floods, we have cause to worry. Uh, there are, you know, uh, several parts of our country, you know, the coastal communities um, can get impacted. I mean, there's very little research that is done on impacts on health of these coastal communities. And when I say health, I mean, not just, you know, in terms of the physical health, but, you know, uh, the mental health as well of these coastal communities. So it is definitely an area of concern <clears throat> and more research needs to be done. In fact, even impacts on livelihoods. I think that is also something that, you know, fishing communities, for example, I think if there's going to be floods and cyclones, what happens to, you know, people living in these areas? And it's not just the fishermen, it's also the women. I think the gendered impact also needs to be accounted for. Women, for example, in uh, coastal communities, in the fishing communities in, in particular, have a big role to play um, in terms of, you know, how the fish catch is handled afterwards in terms of selling. So the impacts on livelihoods is also something um, that needs to be uh, thought about for a country like India. Where would you say the research priorities need to lie, ma'am? In terms of uh, health impacts, I think uh, things have changed a lot in the last five to ten years. I think air pollution was a big area of concern for us. And I think that in that space, uh, the evidence base has definitely increased. It has changed. We have more and more evidence homegrown evidence, as I'd like to call it, on the health impacts uh, from poor air quality, exposure to poor air quality. We have a growing body of uh, researchers working on uh, heat health. Um, but I think what's under-researched is probably the flooding and cyclones and how that impacts the health of populations. I think that's an area that needs attention. And definitely mental health. You talked a little earlier about preventive measures, ma'am. So India, uh, the Prime Minister chaired a meeting recently also to look into uh, what is going on with regard to uh, the heat waves across the country. And India, state-wise, has drawn up heat action plans. What, how are these working out and what more needs to be done in terms of government intervention for heat? I, I think it's it's good to note that you know the, the the policymakers are also you know taking cognizance of the fact that you know these are important uh, areas that need attention. Uh, now from that lens, I think we do have a specific um, you know flagship program uh, under the Ministry of Health, the National Program for Climate Change and Health, which has done very well in the last few years um, in terms of bringing awareness across states on a number of different issues, definitely air pollution, but there has been a big focus on heat as well. And the heat action plans that you mentioned, uh, I think every state has been mandated to develop a state action plan for climate change and health. And within that, there is air pollution, there is heat, there is flooding, there's nutrition. Um, there's also, you know, from the outcome side, looking at uh, the non-communicable diseases, uh, mental health. But, you know, it's one thing to have the plans, customize them for your state. But there's also, as expected, there's always gaps between the planning and the implementation. And there could be many reasons why that is so. It could be resources. It could be manpower. It could be just awareness. Um, or it could be funding. And uh, state action plans are good at state level. But I think the issue is very granular. I think we need more decentralized action. And uh, certainly, I mean, I think that's also been thought about. There are now uh, measures being taken to have district action plans. At another level, we have city action plans. And I think one that definitely uh, needs mention is uh, the classic, uh, the Ahmedabad heat action plan, uh, which is, uh, you know, we talk about it as South Asia's first successful city heat action plan. And that's kind of a good template for other cities to look at. Um, we had one for Orissa as well, but this is a plan that has worked really well and actually shown to have reduced both morbidity and mortality in the city. 
it's a very classic exemplar of intersectoral action. You know, the public health department, uh, the education department, uh, the meteorological department, everybody coming together year on year to revise this plan. Since 2010, I think this plan has uh, learned over the years and made it only better. And I think it's a good example to take away for other cities. And uh, it has been shown that it has impacted uh, both morbidity and mortality in the city. How are we doing in terms of budgetary allocations uh, uh, from the center and from states uh, specifically for extreme climate events? I would not know the figure off the top of my head, but I knew, do know that the National Health Mission has kind of, um, uh, you know, contributed to this program. The National uh, Program for Climate Change and Health uh, came into being uh, because of the focus within the NHM on climate change. The allocation for the program is at the central level. How it gets distributed to the states is something that I'm not privy to, but I, I guess uh, states have a role as well. Health at the end of the day is a state subject. So if states are kind of prioritizing during their PIPs, you know, when they make their program implementation plans, I think uh, each state should kind of take into cognizance what their vulnerabilities are. Um, and, and, you know, ask for the budgets accordingly. And, but I think once budgets are allocated, it's also how it gets used. I think uh, prioritization and allocation of resources for areas that require it most is very important. A big piece of work that needs to be done is on uh, health workforce uh, sensitization. Um, and I say that because uh, climate change as, as a theme has not been incorporated into curricula, for example, of medical schools, nursing schools, or any other, uh, you know, uh, curricula. And I think it's an important gap that needs to be addressed. Some steps have been taken towards that direction also, because unless there is awareness and sensitization, uh, there is not going to be uh, action. So again, I would uh, like to, you know, mention that the National Program for Climate Change and Human Health under the leadership of the Secretariat at the National Center for Disease Control has done extremely well to uh, enhance awareness on heat health. Um, there is uh, uh, IEC materials that have been developed and shared with states that has been uh, translated into local languages. And there is a huge push for enhancing awareness. Um, at the health facility level, there is a lot that can be done as well in terms of preparedness and adaptation response. And I think a suitable adaptation response can only happen if there is a linking to the forecasting. So unless there is a good early warning system that is linked to our health infrastructure, to the healthcare facilities at every level, the preparedness response cannot be optimal. So I think there's a lot to be done in terms of linking up these different verticals and making sure that there is a coherent response when there needs to be. Last question, ma'am. How is India placed uh, relative to the rest of Asia and the globe when it comes to climate change and extreme weather events? If we look at the Global Climate Risk Vulnerability Index, which is put out by, I think, the German Watch Observatory, I think India rank, ranks among the top 10. So in terms of extreme weather events, like I mentioned before, we are seeing more and more of these weather uh, extreme events. And in terms of how we map to South Asia, other countries, I think India, Bangladesh, I think we are all in that, uh, you know, the top few countries in terms of vulnerability. In terms of adaptation and preparedness and response mechanisms, I think we have done well as compared to some other countries in Southeast Asia, for example, like uh, South Asia, for example. I think we have a good uh, national action plan for climate change and health uh, with the Ministry of Environment. We do have, I mean, like I mentioned, the national action uh, plan within the National Program for Climate Change and Human Health, which is under the Ministry of uh, Health. I think what the gaps would be is in terms of actually taking it down at a granular level to districts and cities and making sure that these plans are actually implemented, which necessarily means actually putting in the workforce that is required, keeping their awareness levels at optimum levels, and also providing them with the right resources to kind of take action 
an act because at the end of the day, the first responders are multiple. It could be city level administrators. It could be the health workforce. Uh, it requires coordination across sectors. Um, and I think uh, I can say we've done fairly well in terms of recognizing the the risks. Um, the opportunities are many. I think we should optimize those. Thank you so much for speaking to us today, Dr. Purnima. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to chat with you. In Focus will be back soon with analysis of the biggest news issues. In the meantime, you can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and other platforms. Just search for In Focus by the Hindu. We'll see you soon.